I'm super excited to show you guys today's podcast. Today's guest is Sam Stokes from The Yank Report. I'm a huge fan of his channel. I found it like over a year ago, I think. Uh, right when he was in his early stages, I found him and Filippo about the same time uh, from Tactical Manager TV. And I loved his contact. Seems like a really chill dude. And I'm super excited to talk to him about soccer, his channel, his life, and everything beyond that. Make sure you guys check out his channel. And I hope you guys enjoyed the podcast. Hey man, nice to finally meet you. Dude, I've been a fan of yours. Actually, it's funny. I found your channel. Um, it was outside the pandemic, so it had to have been a little bit over a year ago. And um, it, you were in your early stages because I found yeah, you. Yeah. I was watching Filippo's videos off of Tactical Manager TV. This was before I actually met him. And then your videos started you know, getting fed to me on the algorithm. And I love the way you talk, man. Congratulations on 10K, dude, by the way. Hell yeah, man. That was like something that I was just like looking at for so long. It just felt yeah. so good to finally get there. How but long did, yeah, uh, how long did that take? Like that trajectory? Oh man. Dude, to I really pop took, off. I think it took like a year and a half to get to 10 K. I think something That's like that. That's amazing, man. How often do you upload? I upload, uh, like twice a week. Oh, that's so like the, the, I would say the first, um, the first month that I had the channel, which mm -hmm. was in November of 2021, I think. Uh, so during mid pandemic, I think that's right. Yeah. yeah. Um, the first month, like nobody watched the channel. <laughs> that's and then, how it always is. Um, after like, I don't know, I put up like 10 videos in that month. I sort of kind of changed the way I was doing it and, and kind of uh, redirected things. And suddenly one video got like a thousand views and the next one got like 2000 views and people started to subscribe oh, and sort of wow. started to develop a style there. Yeah, and it kind of, that fell in and, and it just kind of grew from there. What type of video uh, did you notice the first time where you were like, oh, this is going to kind of stick like this type of video people like? Well, the, the whenever I initially started the channel, it was like a, um, a review for the American soccer mm -hmm. players that uh, played that week. So it was like a Yanks abroad type review. Yeah, like yeah. a lot of people do that type of thing. Uh, and it was just very straightforward, like Christian Pulisic played this weekend. He got a goal for Chelsea. Uh, he looked okay. He came off the bench. Wes McKinney didn't do that great this mm -hmm. weekend, that type of thing. Uh, and it was just, it was just the type of content that you could get anywhere else. Whenever it really, I think uh, there was two videos that, that like really changed it. Mm -hmm. Um, the, the first one was a video on Brian Reynolds. He had a oh. transfer or, or was, um, looking at a transfer brian reynolds is this right back for fc dallas okay. uh, and he was being sought after by uh roma by fiorentina in italy and by juventus in italy uh and wow. it was like a nine million dollar transfer it was a big deal yeah um and i i had like a clickbaity type headline but it was like uh why Brian Reynolds transfer changes everything or something like that. Oh, uh, and I really felt that way because it was yeah. like the first time that like, um, a, a player was coming out of MLS as a teenager that mm -hmm. had not really impacted the league at all. You know, like oh, he yeah, was yeah. just a, a youth Academy prospect. He never really, he was never like an MLS all-star. He was only had like a, a handful of starts for a season. And yet he was being looked at as this major transfer. So it was a really big that's moment. Rare, I dude, that's like, rare for America. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I, I told that story. And that that started like a lot more people looking at the channel. That's and then amazing. the next one was, um, this was like right at the end of the year. So mm -hmm. let's, I started the channel in November. So this would have been December. And it was like, why 2020 was the greatest year ever for American soccer. And I kind of like went through oh, like wow. the whole calendar year and just talked about like, you know, in this month, Christian Pulisic did this, you yeah. know, he joined Chelsea and this month, uh, Wes McKinney did this. And it, it like kind of went through the whole year and showed like, this is all the things that are happening. And like that style of video, uh, where I was like, just, I, I don't know, it was more narrative and just like putting more work into like, um, looking at a single topic and like really telling that story, like really, uh, kicked off for me. And, and that helped Dude. the channel grow way more than the Yanks Abroad type stuff. That's amazing. And, you know, one thing specifically about your channel that I noticed that I I enjoy, and the reason I enjoy watching your videos is the way that you speak and how you speak. It's uh, it's it's like soothing. I don't know. You have a very, uh, the, the your voice is very consistent, if that, if that makes sense. It's not like monotone, but it's not also like, it's not too boring, but it's also not like, like too much. Like I can't take it. You know, you have a very straightforward and you, you look, you seem like a really good public speaker. Have you ever had experience in that? 
No, not not really, really public speaking. I wow. mean, I never really was worried about public speaking like, okay, coming okay. up. I haven't had to do that very much. But like, uh, as far as being able to like look into a camera and, mm-hmm. and like deliver a message, um, I, it's something that I had to work on. It's some, oh, not wow. something that was like I came right out the gate with that was very good. I mean, it very like I very much look at like YouTube and like this thing as mm-hmm. like a craft, and like there's a lot of little skill sets that For you sure. have to improve upon. Uh, so that's something that I definitely worked on to just like get better and better with each video. Uh, and, so yeah, definitely tonality of the voice and everything. I, like I mean, the, yeah. it certainly helps. What's your, it also uh, helps that like, go ahead, go I ahead. do video production for a living and I, I've like had, I've done oh. voiceovers for commercials and stuff. So like, what? I have a little bit of experience with that. Like I understand how to talk. So wait, that wait, certainly wait. helps as well. Let's get into that. First off, um, the voice commercials and the video production. So voice commercial, what kind of voice commercials have you done? Um, I've done voice commercials for like small time, time events in my town. Like oh, I, I have so a small cool. video production company and I, I work with events and nonprofits and whatever else. So, so that's what you do I've for a voiced- living beyond YouTube? Yeah, yeah oh, that's, that's my amazing, main job. amazing, dude. That's such a dream. My girlfriend's into that field right now, and so that's that's awesome. I love hearing that uh, someone who, who is in YouTube already has been involved in the program or like stuff like that in, in general. Um, so how exactly did your start go with soccer or football? As far as like YouTube or as your, far as... If, we'll start with your upbringing. Like how, what was your first influences into it? And then what was your influence into getting into YouTube specifically? Gosh, I mean, like every other kid in America, I grew up playing soccer. Mm-hmm. I mean, everybody does that, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, what so, position? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> my dad was the head coach of oh, our okay. team, you know, and then yeah, yeah. eventually I I was pretty good and I got brought on to this, uh, to this youth team, this like recreational youth team that was just like a soccer factory in oh. South Louisiana. <laughs> like we, my team was like unbelievable. I, okay. I remember like whenever uh, the, the open tryouts happened, mm-hmm. uh, I had to pretend like I was not very good. So like, they, my, my parents like put me in like uh, terrible clothing and like not soccer looking stuff. And I had to go out and pretend like I sucked so that this team could pick me up. Oh, wow. Like, <laughs> Wait, because if you were yeah. too good, they wouldn't pick you up? It, it was like it was a recreational tryout and uh, the team like the the good team wanted me on their team but uh-huh. uh any team could have picked me so i had uh, to like make sure that nobody else wanted me so that they could pick I me get first it now. you know I it was get that it. type of thing wow uh, very very funny and this was like i mean like 9 years old something like that oh my you god know? So, dude what position did you play yeah. i was a goalkeeper you were a goalkeeper yeah wow yeah. so you got some hands that, on you I mean, I was very young. Like, I, I stopped playing soccer when I was very young. I, oh, really? I wasn't that good. And it's probably because I was a keeper. So, like, <laughs> I didn't develop the the rest of the skills that, like everybody else. But, like, whenever I was playing with that team, like, all those kids were really good at soccer and, yeah. like, uh, were really into it. And I, the, um, the coach of the team's grandmother was, like, a, a big soccer family. And I remember going over there and, like, watching, like, the uh, – uh, what was it? The, the first women's world cup, which was, I don't remember when oh that was, uh, yeah, yeah. whenever that was, you yeah. know, they, they were big, a big soccer family. Uh, and th- that got me into watching like the EPL and stuff and, wow. uh, just having that like a big part of my life. I remember we were playing like those very early FIFA games uh, <laughs> yeah. and, and it was just soccer all the time. So I think that's like kind of what kickstarted the, the, uh, soccer as a part of my life. So then after that, you know, you, you quit soccer playing soccer and then, you know, you kept continuing watching it. And when was it the decision? Like, you know what? Fuck this. I'm going to start talking about it on the camera. Uh, I think the big part of that was the pandemic. I okay. Mean, um, that's the same thing for Filippo yeah. actually. Yeah. I think that's the same thing for a, a lot of people, man. I mean, like you, you have all this time on your hands and suddenly, like any of those ambitions that you had mm-hmm. that you, you thought to yourself, like, if only I had time, I'd be able to start this. Yeah. Now, like, you don't have excuses, right? Now it's like, well, I've got nothing but time. I've got the equipment. I've got all this stuff. I need to just like do it, like put up or shut up. So, right. Uh, Would you that ever was go- sort of, Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That was sort of where the rubber met the road for me. That's amazing. Would you ever go full time? Like what would that, what would be required for you to be like, you know what? I'm just going to start doing just YouTube. Or would you uh, never do it? Oh, no, I would absolutely do it. Um, 
I, it would just be about money, just about mm-hmm. making sure that I can, yeah, yeah. you know, live off of it. Um, and we're not super far away from that right now. Yeah, which is that's exciting. amazing, dude. Uh, do you have yeah, a team? I, do you have a team or is it I just you? I do not you? have a team. No, oh I'm the God. team. <laughs> dude, you are the team. You know, I was talking, um, I have a, um, you know, you actually know my friend Maxwell. Uh, I met yeah. him w- w- through Filippo and then we actually became like buddies because he lives like uh, an hour and a half away from me. And um, he was just on my podcast that released today. And we were talking about like what it took for him to really go full time because he was a student. And I mean, he's still technically a student just to graduate. But, you know, he's in a different position also. But once you make that amount of money where you're like, oh, dude, I'm making enough to more than the average like American off of just YouTube. That's like the line right there. You should just go all balls to the wall all in because that's what he does. And like that dude is obsessed with YouTube. Um, how much of your week is devoted in your channel? Uh, it, it depends on like what's going on. Like if it's a, uh, if it's a week where there's like games going on, mm-hmm. um, then it would be a lot more. If it's a yeah, period where there's not a lot happening, then it's a little bit less, but I would say, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> I don't know, 12 hours, something like that. Oh, wow. Yeah. Maybe. yeah. Uh, you mentioned Louisiana was, uh, where you were from originally, or do you yeah. still live there? Yeah, yeah, I'm still in oh, Louisiana. You're from Louisiana. It's hot as hell it's right now. It's hot as a motherfucker. You know, I've never been down there. I have my um, my my roommate's family has a, a few members in there, so we want to go visit sometime. But you never know. Um, have you ever been? Well, I know you've been to Orlando to meet up with Filippo, right, for that game. Have mm-hmm. you ever been to North Carolina? I've never been to North Carolina. Oh, it looks we awesome. Gotta, we got to get you out here, man. We got to get me, Maxwell, <laughs> the whole gang. We'll get you out here. That'd be fun. Yeah. Um. I want to ask you, beyond just U.S. men's national team, because I know that's your expertise, that's where you're all about. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. But beyond that, what kind of fandom uh, are you, like, what kind of fan are you? Like, oh, that's the wrong phrase, uh, or ter- bleh, wrong question. What teams do you support outside of just U.S. men's national team? I, you know, one of the, the things that makes the U.S. men's national team unique is that, like, uh, people support it year-round. Yes. Uh, it, in other countries, they don't really do that. You know, like they yeah. have the windows where they support the national team and mm-hmm. then they go back to their favorite club team. Uh, it, it's sort of unique that we have it this way. And I think it's this way just because of uh, how soccer has evolved in this country. But I would definitely put myself in the camp of people that like, I follow the national team. I follow the American players. Uh, okay. Wherever the American players I are see. playing, those are the teams that, that I watch. I don't really have like a club that like, I support through thick and thin, you know. Okay, so you just support like, the players. You're a player fan. Yeah, yeah. I like, love that. I though. watch a lot of Chelsea right now, but if Pulisic leaves Chelsea, then I'm not going to be watching as much Chelsea. I'm going to watch wherever he's at. I am the same way, and I'm so sad because um, I'm actually friends with uh, Gianluca's brother, and so I've been mm-hmm. following him, and then I'm just sad about this whole Venezia thing, dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's just yeah, tragic. Yeah, you really fall in love with that club. That club is yeah. awesome, man. Oh I mean, God. the fashion, the yes. stadium, just like I was everything there. about it. Or I wasn't at the stadium, but I was at an away game for theirs uh, where they played just like the worst team to go to. It was uh, Reggio Emilio. It was um, Sassolio or Sassolio. I don't know how to pronounce yeah. it. But they fucking wrecked them <laughs> like 3 1. And it, 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 the crowd was ridiculous. There was more Venezia fans that went away than there were their own home fans. It was really weird. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, so ha- have you been to any game where you were just like, holy shit, this is an amazing atmosphere? Probably that. I mean, that game, that game in Orlando yeah. was like probably the closest I've come so to that. I'm so jealous, like, bro. I wanted yeah. to go to that so bad. That was absolutely sick, man. I think everybody could kind of feel like the tension in the air and yeah. like understood like what was on, on the line. Like basically, you know, if you win this game, you're in the World Cup. And like, I think everybody in the stadium <sighs> felt that. Dude. And it was just... That's so. Cool. I mean, I've been to, I went to three uh, U.S. soccer games mm-hmm. this, this this cycle, uh, and that one was by far like just awesome. And it was a blowout, and you know, it, uh, yeah, that's to see amazing, dude. That incredible goal from Christian Pulisic. We uh, saw a hat trick, just like a lot of great things in that game. I mean, 
it, it's rare throughout the cycle that you get to see Christian Pulisic and Gio Reyna at the same time on the field. Oh my you know, God, dude, so I love Gio. That. I I yeah. really hope, I really wish and hope uh, that we get to see more of him on the pitch, healthy, because I really feel like this is just my personal opinion, and you're the you're more of an expert than I am. I'm just kind of like a casual fan that follows the U.S. Uh, pretty f- well of all the national teams. That's the one I follow. Um, Gio Reyna has easily the highest ceiling to me out of all of our players. I think that he he has potential to be like European class and even above the average European player. That's my opinion, though. What's your takes on Gio? I mean, you're saying above the average European player. I think we have a lot of players that are above yeah, the average Yeah, okay, European well, what I right meant now. by that is, like, I'm talking top tier. Like, I'm talking yeah. cream of the crop. That's what I meant by not above average. Obviously, Polistic's above average. He's he's in the yeah. freaking Euros. Uh, uh, Weston McKenney and some of the other guys. But, yeah, I, I think Gio Reyna is just, like, can be a top 20, yeah. 20 30 player. When you start talking about, like, when you start having soccer conversations, you eventually get into like what is world class and like mm. defining world class. There you know, we go. That's that what that's the and, better term of it. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you yeah, meant. To me, like I look at someone like Christian Pulisic, who's on Chelsea, which is one of probably the yeah. six best teams in the world right yeah. now. They won the Champions League last year. I mean, they're they're up there as there. There's not many bigger, better clubs in the world. Mm-hmm. The fact that he's like a regular featured player for them, yeah, yeah, yeah. puts him in a pretty high standard. Yeah. Like, there's not that many better players at his position in the world than mm-hmm. him. So he's pretty high up there already. Uh, but yeah, I, I you look at Gio Reyna. I think he's 19 years old right now. Yeah, he is. I mean. He seems to be growing every week. He he's hasn't even grown into his body yet, and already yeah. he's just shown so many different facets of his game. Like we've seen him score a bunch of different amazing goals. We've seen him set up. He seems to have this mentality that's just perfect for uh, a player that's just going to grow and blossom. And yeah, the the saddest thing for American soccer this year has been yeah. Gio Reyna's injury issues. Yeah. Uh, so hopefully he can come back and 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 contribute starting next season. Because I think if he's playing on the national team in the World Cup, we're going to fare a whole lot better. Yeah, I agree. Uh, what do you? What's your opinion on um, or your take on the most valuable player in the U.S. men's national roster towards the World Cup? Like, who is the guy? Would you say if you were Coach Sam? <laughs> Coach Sam, I was, who's the most valuable player? Yeah, because I, I mean, all throughout World yeah, Cup ahead. qualifying, it was Tyler Adams. That was that mm-hmm. was the answer to the question. Okay, um, but moving in forward. this last, what's that? But moving in this forward. last window, yeah, yeah, yeah. In this last window, we saw the team kind of change formations a little bit and mm-hmm. just had some tactical tweaks, uh, which put a little bit less of an emphasis on Tyler Adams. So I, I wonder if that's a little bit off of him right now. I really thought that the best player that I saw during World Cup qualifying was uh, was Weston McKinney. Um, he didn't play that many games. He played like eight of sixteen games, something mm-hmm. like that. Uh, I, I thought the games that he did play, he was just a force. Like he was I untouchable. Agree. I mean, that game against Mexico in November, the Dos Acero game. I mean, he was just an absolute force in that midfield. Uh, so he can reach that level. I mean, there's nobody that can affect the team like Christian Pulisic right now. Yeah. Uh, so he's super important. Uh, if, if I were to pick a most valuable player, I guess, I guess he would be Pulisic right really? now. Okay. I, I think yeah. like, the best version of Pulisic just impacts his yes, team in a way that nobody else can right now. Okay. That's just the thing is we haven't seen like the best version of Pulisic so much. I think we saw some really good Pulisic in the Uruguay and the Morocco games yeah, yeah, and that yeah. helped the team lift to a higher level. So I'd probably go with him right now. I'm very flip flop between him and McKinney. Cause like the Pulisic has, I think the higher uh, potential for like a better game than McKinney, but McKinney consistency it seems to me like he's just so fucking consistent, but he obviously he hasn't played because of the injury. But um, yeah, the thing with McKinney that I will give him like a little bit more, just that tad bit of extra is his physicality. I think that we don't really have many players that is on that like, because you know we're all young. Like, we're like one of the youngest mm-hmm. teams in the World Cup, and so there's not a lot of physical players. I mean, yeah, we got Morris, but like it's Morris. I don't even know if he's gonna make it to the roster. But um, McKenny's got got that big big body. Do you think? I know I watched your recent video. Um, you said that you you think that Morris will take that 26 man spot. 
I said no. I, I said Morris would be like the twenty fifth. I mean, I, I had okay, rolled 25th, on as my twenty sixth right. man, oh, yeah. which was uh, highly controversial. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, at this moment in time, it's I think hard. it's Morris. I, I honestly think once you get past like twenty three, yeah. um, there's, I just don't think that we're gonna see at all twenty six guys contribute to this team. No way. I don't think that we're that deep. I, no. I think we saw throughout World Cup qualifying, especially after the Panama game. The mm-hmm. Panama game was the worst game in World Cup qualifying. After that, I mean, Greg started, like, restricting the roster, and we stopped yeah. seeing as much rotation, and we just started seeing the same guys. Like, I think after that Panama game, like, like Anthony Robinson played every single game at left back. You know, yeah. like, uh, Tyler Adams wasn't coming out. Like, we were just playing the same guys every game. I think we'll see more of that in the World Cup. So mm. uh, I don't think that the back hat, like the the last five guys on the roster is as important as uh, a lot of people make I it out to be. I mean, uh, it's, worth, but it's yeah, more for I them, think, you know, because then you're like, oh, I got I'm in the World Cup roster. Like that's, you know, it's one of those like ego boost things. Um, do you think do you think out of like the best? OK, if both of these players played their best game ever. Who would you take? Okay, just just based off of a one game performance, best game ever, um, Zach Steffen or Matt Turner? Uh, like who has I would the go highest? With Matt Turner. Okay, okay. I I feel like a lot of people are starting that's... to pick him because of what, what happened with Man City at the end. Yeah, <laughs> he's it was embarrassing, bro. Steffen has struggled, man, and not yeah. just with the U.S. He's struggled for a long yeah. time now, and it, it's it feels more like he's getting exposed. Uh, than anything else like the more he plays the the worse he looks Um, we have this thing in in um in the national team discussion where the team plays so infrequently that the majority of the discussion happens in the abstract like we're Mm. we're always discussing things that are not easily comparable yeah i agree i agree agree. yeah like how do you how do you compare (laughs) like goalkeepers whenever only one gets to play in a game yeah that's, that's true how can you say this player will, will play in this moment? How can you say the striker in the Swiss league is going to be better than the striker in MLS? You know, yeah. like it's an impossible comparison. You can only really do it in the abstract. And we're kind of pulling it like different statistics and stuff to try to figure out who would look better, but really it's just an abstract discussion. Uh, so that happens so much for the national team. But I, I think we see so often that like whenever we actually get to these windows and we get to see these guys, Like we just get hit with these realities. And I think one of the big realities throughout qualifying that I think it took a little bit longer for uh, Greg Berhalter to realize that I'm super comfortable, comfortable with, but it said Matt Turner's a guy. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you, I I think he's the guy. How do you feel about uh, Greg? Like un, like unbiased, straight up, like straight opinion. If you were to give him a rating as a coach from zero to 10, are you in the more, uh, the dirty Brazilian Filippos camp where you're going to give him a zero or a one, <laughs> or are you going to be like, going to be more generous? Like what, what are you in, in terms of him being a coach technician and also like, you know, a player coach? Uh, I mean, it, it really depends on like how, what you think you should get out of a national team coach or just a coach in general. Uh-huh. Um, and, and for me, I, I think a national team coach, like, you don't have a lot of time with the team. So it's not like you're instituting like these really crazy, uh, like Pep Guardiola style systems, you know, you're you're not going to have that. Um, So what you're really there for is like uh, fostering camaraderie, making sure everybody's on the same page, making sure everybody knows their job and their purpose and like uh, putting together a group that's better than the sum of their parts. And I think whenever you judge it through that lens, I think he's been fine. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say he's like a, a set six or a seven or something okay. like that. Yeah, I yeah, mean, yeah. I was laying at a 5.56, like five, so I'm, we're about the same. Yeah. yeah. So he, if you think about like results-based, I mean, he qualified for the World Cup, which was mm-hmm. the most important thing. He won the Gold Cup, and he won the uh, the Nations League. And in the games against the toughest opponents in Uruguay and Morocco, the U.S. looked uh, – looked fairly competent. They were able to create chances. They got a pretty good result against Morocco where a lot of things fell their way. Uh, they got a, a really good result against Uruguay where that one could have gone either way. Yeah. But, you know, it ended up with a tie, which I think was a fair result on the day. Uh, so it, it's hard. It's hard not to, uh, it's hard to judge him too harshly, but I, I think for me, a lot of that comes from just kind of how I look at coaches, especially national team coaches. I think mm. that that's, I think that's an area where like, people tend to like criticize that so hard, not just with the, na- the American national team, but across the board, just because it's like the one area of the team where like 
you can actually change something because with a yes. national team, it's not like you can go out and sign some new striker and bring some new mm-hmm. striker in. Like you pretty much got what you got, you know? Uh, so it's like the one area where it's like really safe to like really go at that guy, you know? Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's a good point. I didn't even think about, uh, that yeah. what you got is what you got. You're, you're, you're pretty right about that. You, Cause you can't really yeah, pick so anyone else. Like early on in, in world cup qualifying and stuff like with this cycle, we have such young players and, you know, during COVID, we didn't get to see this team play together very often. So like we were really discussing in the abstract and we were really talking about like, what's it going to look like when Tyler Adams and Christian Pulisic and Weston McKinney get on the field together? This is going to be a, a, a U.S. team like we've never saw before. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the reality is that they were very young players that have never really played before at that level. So there was always going to be like a growing process. And I think we saw that throughout World Cup qualifying. And I think if you look at the team, uh, that played in Nations League, um, that that won Nations League, uh, compared to the team that like played uh, against Uruguay, like there was a lot of growth, and, and the team mm-hmm. has gotten uh, much better over that time, and and I, I think that that's all part of it. Uh, and and whenever I look at national teams, like in general, I mean, there's not that many like great national team managers. Uh, there's not that many World Cups <laughs> that I look back on and say like that manager won the World Cup. You know, right, generally the, the national team manager is just there to like you know, set the roster and more often than not the team with like the bout the six Ballon d'Or candidates, like when, you know, that's <laughs> yeah, 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 how it yeah. goes. It's not like you have like, um, a lot of, um, a lot of Cinderella stories, like no, I going through the world cup. Generally it's like the best players win. Greg, so uh, Greg gets a lot that's of hate. where I'm at on it. Yeah. Greg gets a lot of hate. Um, I, I, some of it is warranted. Some of it is unwarranted. I feel like there's just, we're Americans. I feel like, well, again, we're Yanks. We're naturally shit talkers. And like, we're very critical on all of our sports teams. Like even when, um, I know when we, uh, as the basketball team got like a silver medal in the, the Olympics, like it was like all hell, like, you know? And so like, it's yeah. just very, um, I think it's just our culture and our way to aspire to be the best period. But speaking of, be, speaking of the World Cup, what are your predictions when it comes to the U.S. team and also the whole World Cup? Like, who do you think will win the World Cup? And then also, how far do you think the U.S. can go? It's funny you ask that because I was like, actually, I'm writing this new Yank Report episode right now that's about like a... Uh, how can how can the uh how, can the u.s become a world soccer power and hell like, yeah what hell is yeah. a world soccer power That's awesome how how do you define that how far away are we from that you don't so have to like, spill um, all your beans but just 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 a little bit just give me a little taste this and well, uh, when is that I video actually, i mean i just what's that when is that video set to release or do you, you know yet you're just still writing right i'm still writing it okay so cool it'll be it'll be in a, a week or so i don't know so whenever we'll you, this release you guys better go check that out because this release next tuesday so <laughs> well i i just uh, a few like last week i put out a video called uh the u.s soccer reality check or something like oh, okay, that that okay. really kind of addressed this topic because i feel like this topic of like setting like reasonable expectations for what this team is and what it isn't mm-hmm. uh really helps refocus so much of like the hostility that's in the fan base. Cause I think right, so much right. of the hostility in the fan base is, um, is because people have like these expectations that this team can be something that it just can't, that it's just, it's just, we're just not good enough. I think it's right the casuals. Now. It's the casual fans. Like I'm talking about even more casual than me where you're like tuning in just because us is playing. You don't actually know the logistics of like the sport and like how young we are. Like all, all the little players, if you know, every single player, you're more than likely going to know, like, we might make it out the group stage. That's just my opinion. I don't think like, that's true. I don't think it's just the casuals, man. I think, that think there's so? a lot of people that believe that like this squad because it is like the most talented American squad okay. that we've ever okay. had, that they can therefore surpass like any result that any American squad has ever gotten. Mm. And frankly, some American squads have gotten lucky in the past. Like yeah, the U.S. Yeah, yeah. made it to the quarterfinals in 2002. Uh, did they have a quarterfinals team and roster? No. Oh man, 2002. You know, the, I wasn't even watching soccer yet. Yeah, <laughs> I was like five. <laughs> I mean, we forget yeah. how much variability is in this game. Like, yeah, like yeah. sometimes the best team doesn't too. win. Sometimes you get lucky. Yeah, matchups too. That's a big thing. Matchups is yep. huge. Yep, yep, yep. Yeah, so to so answer your question, it, yep. uh, how do I see this team doing? Uh, we're in a very difficult group. 
Uh, we're in a group with England. England is uh, the odds-on second favorite to win. They've got an incredibly strong team. Uh, yeah, but England, England has a rough history. <laughs> yeah. They are chokers, dude. One of the funny <laughs> things about like American fans and England is like we have this confidence about England that it's just like so ridiculous. Like I, I think it comes from just like the uh, the Revolutionary War. Like it started there. Like we just I have agree. this no, this but little like little brother complex where it to, comes to England. <laughs> to take a really quick tangent on England, there and I've been watching soccer since uh, probably two thousand seven, two thousand eight. That that national team, I I've never seen a national team have so much incredible deep talent that doesn't mesh well together. Like I, I just don't understand when they're good, they're great, of course. But then there's a lot of times where they just don't work well together. It's like you guys have some of the best talented people, and then it just doesn't look like they're their best on the field, except for like Harry Maguire, which is like, how the fuck is he doing good right now? <laughs> you know? Yeah, I sorry. see them. I see England and Mexico as like very similar as soccer oh, nation. Okay. Okay. Because if like I I get I get really like deep into like what makes a nation like a good soccer nation. Yeah. And like a lot of it that. has to do with like population. Like that's mm. a, like if you don't have like a like fifty million people in your country, you're just not going to be all that great at soccer. And then like okay. GDP is very important. How many people are actually playing uh, in your country? And if you look at those like metrics, uh, one of the nations that jumps out at you is like mexico like mexico is one of the most populous nations in the world they have mm. a, a sizable gdp like it seems like they're a soccer crazy nation there it seems like they should be like performing a lot better than they actually are I whatever agree. they're they're not they're they're like a top 20 team whatever they should be like a maybe like a top 10 12 team or something like that oh, yeah and i think they have like a lot of the same issues as england where they have like just I, I think those two nations have the most toxic and just like crazy media and expectations <laughs> yes. uh, of any nation Dude, and they yes. have to carry that with them it's always a soap opera with england and yeah. mexico like there's just always 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 issues yeah uh, and whenever they get to the highest level they they, they somehow fa fail to perform but i also think like another big part of like what separates uh nations at that level is like culture and i think okay. both of those nations have like soccer cultures that are so ingrained and important to those countries mm -hmm. that um, they put the culture ahead of um, maybe getting better and, and like the changing uh, nature of the sport. Uh, whereas uh, I remember, uh, I, think, I think whenever Jurgen Klinsmann took over the German national team, like they had just suffered a terrible uh, World Cup and, and they were very down on themselves. And they, they said, okay, we're going to, reevaluate everything that we're doing we're going to look at all the youth stuff we're going to figure out what's wrong mm -hmm. uh with our soccer culture and we're going to fix it and like that's what they did they just they went in and changed everything uh and, and in a few years they were once again world cup winners i don't think england and mexico approach it the same way at all yeah. i think that they're both like this is what we do it's been successful for us you know this is tradition we care about tradition more than anything else and damn it we're we're going to be just uh, traditional until it kills us. And I think, and that, it's, I think it's similar with both countries. <laughs> well, at least they're in a better position than Italy. Like, yeah. I, I, like that shit is insane. All right, now it's going, going back. All right, sorry we went on that tangent. But U.S., how far do you think we can go realistically? I think realistically, if you look at this group, uh, so England is the second odds-on favorite to win the tournament. So they're far and away the team that's likely to, uh, make, to it out. Yep, advance, yep, yep. make it out the group. Uh, beyond that, uh, the U.S. is second most likely to make it out the group, but we're only a few odds points ahead of Wales. Mm -hmm. uh, Iran is like the um, is, is pretty far behind, but they're, they're a pretty strong team as well. Uh, I, I think round of 16 is where this team is. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and then once you get to that point, it's about that matchup and um, who do you play and, and can you, can you just get a lucky day? You know? Yeah. I, I think, I, I think round of 16 is basically what this team is. If they make it to the quarterfinals, then like it's, it's an incredible achievement and yeah. we should all be uh, amazed uh, sort of the point of, of what I'm making for the, um, for the, can the U S become a world soccer power uh, video is like, whenever you look at these teams that make it to the quarterfinals, like the top eight teams in the world, the difference between their rosters and our rosters is absolutely stark. 
like night and day bro yeah yeah whenever we think about like getting better as a as a national team i i think we think about like uh getting better as like this linear thing you know like it's just like step and step and step like like for as long as i can remember the u.s has been like the 20th best team in the world something like that along those 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 lines and then once you get to the world cup uh a lot of the teams that are ahead of us don't make it to the world cup because they're either uefa or they're south american teams that don't qualify because they don't get enough spots so Mm -hmm. the u.s gets bumped up into like the 15th best team in the world, something like that uh, in the world cup, which allows us to get to the round of 16. Yeah. So even the fact that we're getting to the round of 16 on a regular basis does not necessarily indicate that we're like the 16th best team in the world. No, 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 it's no. just because of the way the tournament works Yeah, uh, that we're able to get there. If they picked the so, best 64 teams or like, or just, just, if they just picked it yeah. up. Oh, we're fucked. <laughs> well, we wouldn't be yeah, fucked. It, it we would, would make a, it in, but not past the group. <laughs> It would be a lot more difficult. It's certainly more. Would. Yeah, Asia would be if fucked start, too, dude. Wait, go ahead. Yeah, consider teams like Ch- uh, like Chile and Colombia aren't going to oh, make it. Like yeah. Italy aren't going to make it. Like these Italy. are all teams that are ranked ahead of us. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it would be difficult. So what happens is like as you start to move up in like the the world soccer rankings, mm-hmm. it's not like a gradual linear move up. Like mm-hmm. it is like a parabolic curve that just starts going straight up oh, wow. until you get to like the elite teams. Yeah. So in order for the U S to progress from a round of 16 perennial round of 16 team to a perennial quarterfinal team, like actually going from the 15th best team in the world to like one of the top steroids. best teams in the world. Steroids. <laughs> Like, I don't think steroids is gonna help. No, we hell need, no. Like, we need. You need a roster that yeah. has some of the best players at every position, and you you just it, it it's it's gonna take time. We're not yeah. there yet, and I think that's the big thing. It's time. I'm gonna go piss, but in the why right before I come back, let's talk about who you think will win it all. All right. It's kind of nice. This is my first podcast filming at my house, so it's like I just go to the bathroom right there. It's kind of convenient. <laughs> <laughs> where were you filming before? Uh, I had a, I have a studio. I still do have a studio um, where I do, it's really my sister's uh, business, one of her businesses, and then she gave me the little storage room unit in the back where she just puts uh, her supplies, and I just made a little corner. But then um, I got a house, and then I got I have another podcast where someone's just going to come over here. It just makes it easier. So I was like, well, I'm just going to bring the equipment here. And just let's shoot it. Um, but yeah, what do you who do you think is gonna win it all, man? Who you got? Let's let's oh, put it down man. right now. Sam's pick. <laughs> let's see. I, I mean, the two South American teams are really good. Uh uh-huh, uh-huh, Brazil and uh-huh. Argentina. Um, England is one of the favorites. I don't I'm worried about their midfield. I don't know about, I'm worried about their choke their, choke game. Yeah, that's a <laughs> that's a big thing. It seems like they, they never can quite put it together yeah uh i would really love to see argentina win it I'd that's really my love pick to see that's my final Messi get carried. that's my pick i mean they looked really good in that what was it the the footballista whatever yeah. finalissimo yep. yep whatever against Dude, italy the fact oh well it's also against italy but <laughs> the fact that um if you, if you look at argentina's roster and i they have names that i can like as an american i can name on their bench that's meaning that means a lot. Like I'm talking about these guys are like starters in the Serie A, like and stuff like that, and they're in the bench. I'm like, dude, where you might be? Like everybody might be fucked right now. But Brazil is also like very stacked, and England again, yeah, England. Um, do you think? Do you think like if that fourth spot out of the the ones we've named, who would be that like next next? Like we were to list. Oh, like, France. Like, I mean, France. Oh, France. Oh, Jesus. The, they, the they're cursed. They're gonna be cursed. The because they already want it. <laughs> they're gonna get that yeah, yeah very few teams win back to back i mean it's a super difficult tournament to win but uh yeah uh i feel bad for th- their th- coach. those are would be 
I feel bad What's for that? their coach. I feel bad for France's coach because, like, who do you even play? Like, you guys have so, you you know, have the, so much talent. <laughs> we were talking about coaches earlier. Uh, like, France, France, like, constantly trashes their coach. Yeah, they don't like yeah. their coach. They yeah. just won a World Cup, and they don't like their it's coach. It's insane. Like, who, who the fuck do you start? You have, like, five of the most talented strikers in the game, and you're like, okay, you got... If you take one away, you're like, fuck, how can I fit them all in? What are you going to run a four <laughs> four up top? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I mean, it, it really takes like, it's 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 not that many games. What is it like? Let's see, three, four, five, I think six games to yeah. win a World Cup. Like you got to, you got to put it together for six games in a row, man. And then once you get to that level where, like you said, you've got like household names sitting on the bench, like everybody's yeah. really good. Yeah. It just, it's just who can put it who can put it together i mean uh world cup games like at the highest highest level yeah. tend to be like stalemates man like they're mm-hmm. just really close and then it's just, i remember seeing some of them somebody gonna make a mistake you know that's why that game um r.i.p filippo but the brazil and germany game was so wild to see i was just like what the fuck i was like a, I was like a teenager just like watching this like oh my god Gee, i feel bad for that <laughs> getting wrecked yeah well that was yeah, that was germany's German year man, man. That, that year, they were fucking stacked out the ass. Um, I want to ask you, um, with the World Cup, World Cup's coming to the Americas in 2026. You know about it. Uh, you getting tickets? We we all getting tickets? Let's fuck you. Yeah. <laughs> we're everybody's Dude, people keep asking too. me if I'm going to any of the games. It's four years from now. I don't know what I'm doing this weekend, man. Yeah. Like people. <laughs> like, no, I I'm know. like, I, I'm dead set, like... I'm willing to, dr- I don't spend money on shit like that, but I am like willing. That's one thing. I feel like you have to go to a world cup in your lifetime. Like that's just insane. And also yeah. the lo- locations that they're picking are going to be like really crazy. Like I heard, um, cause I know like you got to have a 80 K facility for uh, the finals or something like that. And there's only like six stadiums or like maybe like, yeah, there's not a lot is what I'm saying. But what's crazy is we went to the Charlotte, me and Felipe went to the Charlotte FC's uh, inaugural game where they broke the record. And I've been to like the Panther Stadium before, and you would never realize that a stadium like that can fit eighty three k people. You're just like, what the fuck? Like it's it's kind of amazing and shocking. I'm kind of pissed they didn't put a yeah. bed down. Uh, do you guys? Yeah, once you get to a stadium that big, man, yeah. it's absolutely crazy being in an atmosphere like that. Yeah, but you know, uh, Filippo was talking mad shit about it because he was like, uh, and and I agree. If you're in Charlotte and it was their first game. There's not a big enough soccer base, like hardcore. It's like people, there's a lot of casuals there. So like, even though it was lit, it wasn't like, ah, like if you were in like Brazil, Argentina, England, even an EPL game, I'm sure is fucking crazy. Like I can't even imagine going to those games. Well, that's, that's kind of uh, unfair, man. Like yeah. asking the uh, MLS. <laughs> In their first game ever to have a, I know, uh, an I know. atmosphere comparable to a hundred year old franchise. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. I mean, he was talking mad like, shit. <laughs> yeah, but like, that's, I don't know, that seems super unfair. I mean, like, yeah. think about this. Like, we always equate that to like the U.S. having this poor soccer culture and for right. the U.S. not being a soccer uh, nation and, and we don't know how to cheer for the game. Uh, in the last six years or so, how many um second tier uh football leagues have there been i'm talking about like american football like there's been the aafl there's been the xfl i think the xfl XFL. is coming back yeah xfl is coming back there's another i forget the one that's on uh fox right now but there's another one you look at like xfl games they're not like crazy in the crowds like there's um i forget the name of the league that's out there right now but there's (laughs) People aren't like going crazy for these yeah. teams and no one's going to sit here and say that like the United States doesn't love American football or doesn't know how to support American uh, okay. football. Yeah. That's, you know? that's fucking valid right there. That's a valid point. I didn't even so think about is, that. Is the issue with, um, with the country not knowing how to support the sport and, and the, the culture not being there, or is there other factors that are involved that contribute to uh, these atmospheres? Like, yeah, does, you know, if someone's not supporting the the new XFL team that just opened up in Houston, does that make, I mean, what does that have to do with like the crowd that like the university of Alabama gets for their opening game? You know, like it's, there's, there's a difference whenever you're talking about the first time this franchise has ever played in this community versus 
something that is tradition that people have grown up with their whole lives that that is just a part of their identity and who they are as people uh and, and i think that 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 is the is the singular thing that is holding american soccer back in this country specifically mls when you're talking about a league that's 25 years old mm. uh that is not very old uh compared to most leagues even in this country i mean like even the, compared to the nba the mlb the nfl like those mm. are all leagues that have been around since the time when our parents were born 50, like 75 we are, years yeah more yeah yeah so the, i mean we grew up with these yeah. things being big parts of our lives mls can't say that and a lot of these franchises in MLS are, are brand new yeah. uh, and they're going to take time to develop that a culture and develop and that like following. That. Yeah. And that's I, not something that you can just manufacture overnight, yeah. with, like bringing in some star or something like that. That's going to take time. Yeah. I want to ask you because, um, cause my take on this, I, I, I'll tell you my take and then I want to hear your, your kind of like opinions on this topic. Um, when I, when I talk to my f friends who are all, we have a group that's just soccer friend, uh, fans and majority of them, you know, they watch the Spanish league. They watch, uh, I think I'm the only one who watched Serie A, but then there's like a bunch who watch the EPL of course. And then we talk MLS and, um, obviously we support Charlotte cause it's close to here. And then we support like, um, certain players and things like that. But when it comes to fixing the MLX or like, like you said, obviously there needs to be some time of course, to build. And then um, one thing that I always come back to personally that I think, I don't know if it'll fix any problems at all, but it will make it more entertaining, in my opinion, is the promotion relegation system. And I know the, um, I think it's, what is it, the ALS wants to, uh, is debating on like, should we even USL? Bring, oh, USL. Sorry, I said ALS. Um, yeah, the USL is debating on like even bringing that in. Uh, what's your opinions on relegation promotion in U.S. soccer? Should we do uh, it? Should I, we I not? Think, Is there too many cons? What's up? Yeah, I think it's one of those things that, like, uh, it, it it really appeals to the romantic in all of us. Like, mm -hmm. it is a very romantic ideal in sports. And I think soccer is a super romantic sport, mm -hmm. especially compared to a lot of the more American sports where I think baseball is a very romantic sport, but not so much basketball and football. Why, uh, why, why do you think that with baseball? Sorry. I don't know much about baseball. I, I just want to know. I think whenever you talk about baseball, uh, there's like, it, it, you talk about the romanticism, you talk about um, the guys who just know the game about the, the I don't know. There's just so much. Oh, um, I see. I know. I get what you're saying. Like, like all the little nuances I'm, I'm, to the sport yeah, versus yeah, something else. Yeah. Like the appreciation I see. I for see. like understanding now, the count and the bunt and like i'm on board um there's still been so many movies made about like I, I, i'm kind of blanking on these movies but there's like these kevin costner movies uh, and it's yes. about like the minor leagues and just like so much like uh history and stuff that's built into it whereas right. uh i think football and basketball are a lot more like um straightforward like just yeah yeah straightforward uh some what uh, my friend uh asa smith made this really good point on his show the uh touchlines and touchdowns podcast that mm -hmm. Uh, whenever we talk about great soccer coaches, like we call them geniuses, you know, mm. like Pep Guardiola is a genius. Jurgen Klopp's a genius. Mm -hmm. They see things on a different level. When we talk about great football coaches, they're hard workers. Like nobody outworks Bill Belichick, you know, like That's nobody, true. like, like uh, Sean Payton is just is, is in the film room all the time and, and they, they work harder than everybody else. And, and it, once you kind of see that, like the, the, the romanticism versus the hard work, like it kind of, makes you look at the uh the things a little bit differently but anyway yeah, yeah. back to back to pro pro rel. Pro rel. so yeah so uh, aside from like the romanticism of pro rel uh I, I think that whenever you look at like the actual logistics of what it would take to make it work in this country it starts to fall apart pretty quickly yeah uh, okay. first of all most european uh countries where it exists uh, like England, for instance, like England is roughly the size of like Arkansas or something like okay, that, yeah, you know, yeah. as a state. So I, I think like the furthest journey you can get in England, like from like the uh, the north, I think I'm trying to show off my uh, my British geography. I think like from the north of Wales all the way to like the, the bottom of uh, of England is like six hours, maybe an eight hour drive or something okay. like that. Uh, that's like a relatively short bus ride in MLS. Us, you know mm -hmm. um so 
it, whenever it comes to MLS, like the, the, the teams are so much further apart that mm. you have to, in order to like put together a, a thoughtful league, a sustainable league, like you've got to consider who's going to play who and how close these, these, these teams are um, right. in order to like logistically make it work. Like you can't have, LA playing New York every week. Right. What, what if we have a bunch fight? of regions and the best of each region makes it up? That would be something that would be possible. But then you move on to the next issue um, facing American soccer, which is uh, investment. Yeah, uh, yeah. Currently, there's just no structure. There's no infrastructure. What we need right now is stadiums. We need academies. We mm -hmm. need scouting systems. We need buildings to be built. We need fields to be built. Uh, we need uh, academy systems to be in place. And in order to do that, you have to get investment. You have to meet with the bank. You have to say, this is our plan. This is how we feel like we're going to get money back on this. And this is how long it's going to take for us to get it. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you start instituting pro rel and you say, Hey, look, we need, you know, $5 billion to build this facility, uh, this Q2 arena out here in Austin, and the bank says, okay, great, but what if you get relegated in the first season and now we lo lose all of our money? It's mm -hmm. like, ah, well, we're not going to give it to you. Mm -hmm. uh, suddenly, it changes how much investment you can actually go out there and get. Uh, and, and that would, I, I think, ultimately set us back from what we're actually trying to get to, which yeah. is um, a, a top-level soccer nation. It's and just... then there's the whole discussion about does ProRail actually produce the results that – uh, pro rel is romanticized to produce. Uh, okay, okay. Like, does it actually weed out the bad investors and get the, the good investors in? Does it actually right. like find talent and develop it? Or, or, or is that not actually how the system is functioning right now? Um, I, I think majority of, yeah. of, of European leagues are in a have and have not uh, area. And, and we've seen a, a bunch of financial instability That's um, true. over the past few decades, a lot of teams that, um, maybe were um, household names for a while have, have fallen on financial hard times uh, and yeah. have fallen out. And that sucks because then you have a, a team like, like Sunderland or like Schalke that yeah. are international brands that are huge for any league. And now they're playing in the second division or in yeah. the third division. And, and that, that sucks. So um, I, I do look at some of the, um, some of the things that are happening across the world uh, where like, I mean, Mexico paused pro rel for a little while and, and they're like really looking at restructuring Liga Mekis and like finding partnerships with MLS in order to secure their financial future. Uh, uh, the Brazilian league right now is looking at possibly breaking off the way that the uh, Premier League did um, to kind of form their own league and kind of renegotiate their TV rights because they're hurting for cash right now and they're looking to modernize, modernize their game. Interesting. Uh, so I, I do question whether ProRel is a um, is a is a solid foundation for a league moving forward. I think yeah. it's like the result. It's it's like one of those things that if you didn't start it initially, whenever it was like very small, uh, starting it now would be very difficult. Just uh, like socialism. So I'm sorry. <laughs> no, but but yeah, I guess it, yeah, no, no, no. Um, it, it's it's one of those conversations that feels really good whenever you're having it. And yeah, you can make a lot of great points, and you're romantic, and you're we need to do this. We're never going to do anything unless yeah. But then whenever you start like getting out the checkbook and start like thinking about yeah. how it would actually play out. The, the holes that hard. you start yeah. seeing are, are pretty tough to ignore. It's just uh, but so a lot of times soccer fans don't want to have those conversations. Yeah, because it, it's just so sad sometimes. And I think the point, the reason why I, I push for it, even though obviously there are those all a lot of alarming holes, especially starting something so like late in the game. Um, I'll go to a certain certain games. Actually, Cincinnati FC, before they were an MLS team, I went to uh, a game of theirs and it was, oh my God, so lively, like, like more lively than MLS games I'll see in at the time on TV. And then also like recently I have fr friends who live in Louisville and we went into the, the Louisville stadium or like by the Louisville stadium and th they have a pretty big like soccer base there. And it's just sad to me because I know like talking to the, some of the soccer fans there, they were telling me like, you know, it kind of sucks because we'll never get the recognition of the MLS and stuff, stuff like that big tier. So that's where I'm like, ah, I get it. It's, it's a hard man. It's a hard one, especially to start this late in the game. Yeah, I. 
that I mean the uh, the liveliness of regular season games is this discussion that happens like not just in soccer mm. but like across the board. yes basketball I mean, too they talk about yeah, yeah NBA like NBA yeah yeah people talk about that in football like towards the end of the year whenever the playoffs are coming around <laughs> yeah. and teams are kind of like taking taking their foot off the ball I mean I have watched a number of super boring soccer European soccer games. Oh yeah. I think the idea that like every soccer game in Europe is just like so important and means so much. And like Mm -hmm. every game is like on decision day or something like that. I don't think that that's accurate either. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I do look at pro rel as like, like the American playoff system has a lot of excitement within it, you know, and the American playoff system directs the excitement to the middle of the table generally so like you you have the top of the table where teams are competing for uh those top playoff spots so they can get buys or whatever else or good placement Mm -hmm. and then you have the middle of the table where they're competing for those last playoff spots and that's where the excitement is pro rail produces excitement sometimes at the top even though a lot of times the top is already accounted for like yeah Yes, it doesn't always produce excitement at the top. Well, the like, whole like Bayern Champions Munich. League, like if you can make it in the Champions League, like that could be. Yeah, so, but that's talking about a couple of leagues, right? Like you're that's talking true. about um, most European leagues don't don't have that many Champions League spots. That's so, true. That's true. So like a team like like a league like the Austrian league, I, I think they only have one. I could be wrong, like about that. I think they're changing the format soon, though. Yeah, uh, true. Yeah. So or like the Scottish League is a good example. They have two, and it's oh, usually yeah. Rangers and Celtic, and that's like decided way in advance. Well, like, so there, yeah. there's no excitement at the top of the table for them. At the bottom of the table, there's excitement for a couple of teams. Usually one team has already been relegated for a long time, so you get like a couple of teams that are exciting. But to me, it's just like a, a, a like there's excitement in the playoff system too. It's just a matter of like where you want it. And then once mm. the playoffs start, playoffs are super exciting, like across the board. I, I don't think right. anybody really argues with yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, playoffs are so lit. Yeah, I was. I think it's just like um, different systems produce excitement in different areas, and it's kind of just where you want it. I, I think a big part of it is that people that watch soccer, uh, people that are really into it, tend to be people that are really interested in other cultures and like appreciate um, appreciate European cultures, especially and mm-hmm. and like. The, the whole romanticism that goes along with it and right. kind of want to see that uh represented in, in america and american sports uh i think that that's a big part of it yeah do you think that uh oh man i i just had it but i lost it so it's fine um with uh, going off subject just a little bit still on soccer um i wouldn't be i wouldn't be a homie if i didn't ask you about a fan of the, or not a fan not only a fan but a guest of the podcast Gianluca Busio. What are your honest, unbiased opinions on Busio? <laughs> I have some too, uh, honestly. Yeah. Like I have some. I'll tell his brother this too. Like it is what it is. That's funny, man. Like I would give you an uh, a biased opinion on him. Yeah, of course it's gonna be honest. Uh, oh well, yeah. I meant I meant like unbiased in a sense of like um, at, uh, knowing that I you know I'm connected a little bit. You know. Oh yeah. Just, I I am a huge John Lucabusio fan. Like I love his game. That's how I, I found really you. liked watching him. Yeah, yeah. You were talking yeah, about I really him in liked video. watching him in Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Uh whenever he got the move to Venezia, I was really excited and, and like he did some really great things in Venezia as well. Mm-hmm. Uh he's a young what is he's nineteen right he now? He just turned twenty. He just turned twenty. Yeah. So he's Recently. he's uh he's very young in the world soccer realm Mm -hmm. and he's also pretty slender and he's pretty slight uh and i think he's he's been um the games where he's looked the worst uh both for the national team and and for venezia uh is whenever he couldn't physically keep up and he's got bumped around but i think he's one of these players that like we're in this like weird bizarre world with the u.s national team where we're seeing so many young players like hit so early that mm-hmm. we're starting to think that like that's what the expectation is mm-hmm. that like at 19 years old you should be contributing to the national team at this high level but that's just not how it really works um mm-hmm. in the world game at all like most people are hitting their peak a little bit later so yeah, like right. i really think that busio could be one of these guys that in four years whenever we're gearing up for the next world cup mm-hmm. like he might be the guy running the midfield he might be the main guy okay but i think just right now at this moment in time uh, we're per- we have these players in Weston McKinney, Eunice Musa, oh, Tyler sure. Adams, Luca Della Torre that that are um, 
that are transition guys yeah. that are very physical, that move very fast, that aren't looking to like sit on the ball and pick out passes the way Busio does. They're looking to like get up field and, and go right down immediately. And I think he just doesn't fit into like the system. I was that lo- the US that's is running exactly right now. what I was going to say. That was my biggest point of everything. When, when it comes to talking to my friends who can, you know, cause Busio grew up in, um, well, he was born in Greensboro. I'm, I'm from Greensboro. I'm actually here right now in Greensboro. And all my friends, you know, we talk about him and um, we follow him. And so one of the biggest things is, or my critiques, is that he doesn't fit Greg Ball. He doesn't, mm-hmm. I don't, like when I saw him in that last rotation, not not this recent one, but the one, um, God, it was with Jamaica and like a few of the other yeah. guys. Yeah. And I saw him, it just seemed like he slowed down play. Uh, he's so yeah. fucking technically talented though. I think he's definitely top tier when it comes to, if we're talking just pure techni- yeah. ne- technicality, skills, and passing, he's going to be in the top. But the problem is, I don't think Greg is going for technical and passing. He's going for fast speed, move up the ball as fast as possible, and let's get a shot in. And so I just, I don't no, know. No, that's exactly it, man. Yeah, that, well, thank you. And I feel, that game, I uh, <laughs> yeah, that game away against Jamaica, the yep. one that he started, yep. the one, yep. I think the one that you're talking about, yep. there was a lot of instances where like Tyler Adams would get the ball off the center backs and he'd be looking forward, and Jean-Luca would be dropping back into space to receive the ball, Mm -hmm. and Tyler would just, like, bypass him. He would just run right by him, and then Luca was just out of sorts with the rest of the team, and, you know, he was just never, like, really on the same page, and that's it's just not his style, and and I think uh, one of the big frustrating things, like, in soccer that, that, like, an argument that happens all the time in soccer is, like, players that are good enough for to like good enough quality for the national team mm-hmm. but don't fit in the national team and there's a bunch mm-hmm. of these guys right now like the biggest is probably john brooks like he's probably number oh, one. Oh on yeah list. well i mean but, i don't I even know what's going on with him and greg but yeah i, I definitely i think bustio and and uh john brooks are kind of similar in that they're both very technical players mm-hmm. uh but neither of them are, are very quick on their feet neither yeah. of them are, are like built for the fast transition game uh, and, and both of them uh, don't just they just don't have the requisite athleticism to play the style that we're playing right now. I agree. Uh, moving up the field, there's guys like Jordan Pifak, who people look at and like he's scoring all these goals. Uh, he, he should be the striker for the national team, but he just doesn't do the off team. That's striker so, position. That's that's yeah. a whole nother fucking thing. Dude. That's our biggest downfall right there. We ain't got no one that can put it back in the net like, consistently. Yeah, and whenever you start looking like uh, whenever you start looking at the top national teams, at like the top ten teams or the top eight teams, oh, they like got some fucking... they don't have holes like this. Yeah, like, they, they don't have, have they'll have three or four players. That can win. <laughs> Let's look at France, dude. I can name like seven. I mean, France is like the number <laughs> one of the top five teams in the world. So I'm like, even whenever you get to like the top, like we just played Uruguay, and or- oh, yeah. Uruguay is the thirteenth best team in the world according to the FIFA rankings mm-hmm. right now, or the ELO rankings, whichever. They've got Edson Cavani, Cavani. and they've got uh, Darwin Nunez, like yeah. two guys that are going to like top teams. Like they're they're not struggling to figure out who their striker is. They've got that. Like that's sort of the gap between the U.S. and sort of like that next echelon right that's now. What we need, man. We just don't have these guys, and it, it frustrates me that we get into all these like just endless, mindless discussions about like you know if if the coach would pick the right roster or <laughs> if we had a different coach or. You know, if this guy would finish his chances or if we yeah. pick this player instead of that player, it's like... It's a hard one, bro. That's a hard one. I get all that would improve us slightly, but the gap between us and the next level is so great that it doesn't matter what we do. Like, even if we yeah. improve 5% here and 5% there, there's still like a 50% difference between us and the next level. So, like, yeah. having these drag-out fights just is just... Uh, Dude, it was just so disappointing getting into this last, like, roster of uh, the U.S. team and then seeing what happened with Pepe because, like, there was just that high, like, that one game where we're all just like, holy shit, we got it. We, we got it in the bag. And then he just fucking fumbles the bag. <laughs> and just, like, even he got signed probably because of that game also. And then next thing you know, he's shit in the bed in, uh, in internationally. Uh, with that, so, that whole thing is just crazy. I don't know. I don't know who's going to be our striker. <laughs> I don't think it's anyone does. Part of the thing of like having to rely on these kids, man. I mean, yeah. that guy's is he 19 years old right yeah, now. Like I think he it, is 19. He shouldn't have to be, you know, the the uh 
the the national team striker yeah. right now. He shouldn't have to be the star boy, but th- it's been put put on his shoulders at this point because so many players before him have fallen short. Uh, so he's in this unenviable position. Uh, just, I mean, a lot like Jean-Luc Abusio. Like, yeah. It isn't really fair that they're being asked to do these things at this level, at this point in their careers. It's because the generation before them have let them down, uh, yeah. that they're being thrust into this spotlight uh, that that's that's causing them to uh, take this ire from fans. Uh, it's not fair, but it's just kind of what we got right now. Uh, aside from the actual team right now, uh, let's go back in the days a little bit. Who is your favorite U.S. men's national team player growing up? Oh, man. I I loved uh, Josie Altador. Oh, Josie really? Altador That's was, a rare one. Yeah. Sometimes I, I, a lot of times I ask this question and they I don't hear that one as much. Yeah, I usually, <laughs> you know, probably, obviously Landon Donovan, Dempsey and all the other, but yeah. Altador, wow, interesting. No, no, I, I love those guys as well. But like Josie Altador was the player that was like my age. Um, he, he started making like, I remember like the first tournament that I like really watched that uh-huh. like really uh turned me from like a, a guy that watched the national team games to a guy that was like obsessed with the national team was the uh confederations cup i think it was in 2009 okay uh when josie outdoor scored against spain and it was like <sighs> this guy is going to be the first world-class american striker like right it's, yeah he's got all the tools i mean he's going to do this uh so i i remember i got a twitter account just to follow josie outdoor <laughs> to like amazing. get news because at that point there wasn't a lot of news on yeah, these players yeah, yeah. so like that was how to get it. So oh, I followed man, his career, amazing. you know, from Hall City, Sunderland, like whenever he went to uh, yeah. Spain, like all that stuff. He so was he nasty, was nasty, dude. He's a big guy too. Like he he fit the role of a striker, like what what you wanted in a striker. I was a big Dempsey guy just because of his off field stuff. The dude is so funny. He's just a goofy ass dude. He yeah, just... he was a character, man. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it, his uh his career arc is like you know we're talking about putting all this pressure on these young guys like Dempsey yeah. wasn't expected to be the guy at a young age you know yeah, yeah. it wasn't until he was like 23 24 that he yep. even made that move to Fulham uh and, and then like I, I think half of his national team goals were scored like after he was like 28 yeah. something like that like it was way late in his career that he started going unconscious in front of goal and just yeah. like started scoring all these goals for the national team it's crazy because I think as we're getting older too, uh, and this is across all sports, people are starting to be able to be more world class or better, like m- still retain their talent at an older age. I'm starting to notice because like we go we go down the line and we start looking at like people. Obviously, Messi's getting older. Ronaldo Ronaldo's fucking an anomaly. Obviously, he's one of the best. And then there's Ibrahimovic. Um, there's you got players. Uh, Buffon's last year, but he's he's old as fuck. Like you got players playing in their forties now, and I'm just like, what the fuck? Like that's crazy to think about Tom Brady, who's yeah. like it's ridiculous. It's probably like science and like modern medicine and technology and shit. Who the fuck knows, yeah. man? That's Diet and crazy. exercise go a long way, but there's still players that like know. we're we're talking about Josie Altador. I mean, Josie, oh, I yeah, think true. he's 32 right yeah. now, uh, and Josie Altador hit about 29, and his body just fell apart on him. You know, Michael That's Bradley's, true. I think, 32 as well. Like, both of these guys Dude, at Michael 32 Bradley. years old, like, should be, like, the leaders yeah. of this national team right now. It shouldn't be, like, who's playing striker for the national team. It should be, like, oh, Michael. How, what are Michael Bradley and Josie Altador yeah. going to do with these young kids? I uh, forgot for this about team? him, dude, until you just said him. Yeah. I remember playing uh, – FIFA 2000, like the the World Cup one, like 2010, what was it, 10? Like Africa World Cup? Yeah, um, 2010. Yeah, I would play that game because it had every country, bro. Like it had Vietnam. I'm Vietnamese, so I was just like, what the fuck? Like it didn't even have like the low-key ones. And then I remember I played the U- with the U.S. team. It was a four-star team at the time. And I'd see Michael Bat- Bradley's bald head shining. And this, I was like, ah, this guy. <laughs> yeah. That just brings me back. I love Michael Bradley too, man. Uh, brings me back. Just a, relentless player just yeah. uh really effort technical player. very effort yeah a lot of effort man yeah. all right oh uh, you gotta what, what are you doing after this man i'm uh i'm hey. going to the gym after this hell That's yeah i'm plan. going to my gym too i have a home gym but <laughs> i'll be doing that hey well I'll, i won't hold you up from your gains get big dude i appreciate you coming <laughs> out here man i really do we got to do this again next time let's let's get um let's get Filippo on it or or okay, or uh, maxwell either yeah, let's get sure. all four of us let's just do a whole oh, soccer boy. pod <laughs> I'd be down. Thanks, man. I appreciate you. For sure, Luna. I appreciate it. All right. Text me if you need anything, brother. Take care. All right. Later.